and welcome uh, to this presentation uh, of storing data on the front-end side. I'm Valentina Ichova. I arrived in Luxembourg last year from Russia. I uh, participated in Luxembourg JS meetups already last year as a listener, but I always wanted to try myself as a speaker. Uh, my work experience is three plus years. I work in a small company named Genic. We do products for banks and uh, also companies hiring now. So if, you, um, if you're interested, you can visit the website for more information. So today we'll be discussing various approaches to store data within your front-end application, <coughs> including local storage, cookies, and then we'll dive into state management on example with React applications. We'll discuss popular state management mm -hmm. libraries like Dux, Mobix, and also Zustand. Uh, by the end of this presentation, you'll have a better understanding uh, of the various approaches uh, to storing data on the front-end side and will be equipped uh, by the knowledge to choose the best approach for your application's need. So let's start and let's start with the question, what actually data should be stored on the front-end at all? It depends on the specific uh, requirements and design of your application. So there are certain types of data there are, um, that are commonly stored on the front-end side. It's user input, some uh, form submission, search queries. Um, also, in order to improve performance and reduce server requests, uh, certain data can be cached. Uh, it uh, can be user profiles data, product listings, some static content like images. And of course, UI state, the front-end can maintain uh, stateful information related to the user's uh, current session. Uh, let's look at the specific example simple landing page. You may not need to use any client-side storage mechanism at all uh, if the page is static and does not require any dynamic dat data. You can simply surf it as an HTML uh, file and do not need to worry about how to store anything. So for example, uh, some um, portfolio some freelancers can be, some photographers uh, can be a marketing landing page like with information about new courses. Uh, what may be the simplest and the basic example uh, to store? It's uh, variables. Variables are used to store uh, data temporarily uh, during the execution of JavaScript function or script. For example, for some math operations, of course, result of calculation, state of UI elements, uh, additional projects and playgrounds. Another way to keep data uh, is to use cookies. Cookies are small text files. Uh, whenever the browser sends an HTTP request to the server, it attaches to the header all relevant cookies. And they are typically used for user preferences, for logging credential, and also for tracking user behavior for um, collecting analytic data, like uh, the number of visitors, page viewed. Uh, it could be a session cookie and persistent cookie. Session cookie only lasts as long as your browser is open, a uh, persistent cookie will continue to exist even if uh, the browser is closed. And the maximum size of a single cookie is typically around 4 kilobyte for modern browsers. Uh, this is how we set cookies and then get them with JavaScript. Uh, another way to keep data is to use local storage. Uh, it's a uh, client-side storage mechanism that allows you to store data persistently on the user's device. It's typically used for user preferred news categories like layout settings, some font size. Also, um, if it is um, a lengthy or multi-step long form, um, we can set a data here. Uh, this ensures that data is not lost if user accidentally close a tab or just uh, navigate away to, to somewhere. And local storage have a limit around 510 megabyte per domain. This is how uh, this code we how we set some data to the local storage and get from it. Apart from local storage, we use a session storage. The data is deleted when the window or tab is closed. Uh, examples to use, uh, some state of the interfaces, some checkboxes, tabs, panel, and also some information um, that you want user only to see once per login, like news pop-ups. Uh, also um, has a size limit, uh, 510 also megabyte per window or tab. Yeah, to sum up, uh, we have a table and by the feature, we can compare all of our approaches. We have a different storage limit, uh, expiration date also different, 
accessible on service via header in HTTP requests, it's for cookies. Accessible on new tab or session storage is not accessible. In the same tab, uh, everything. Uh, a performance cookie is a little slower because it's included in the request to server and by persistent. So yeah, the choice of which storage mechanism to use depends on the type uh, being stored. You just need to, uh, to, to, to compare the, the, all of the approaches. Uh, with the advent of single page application came state management solutions. Let's consider another specific example. You need to do a small task task uh, like counter or to do list. You can use uh, just a few state a hook. Uh, it's a simple and straightforward and it can be a good choice if you don't need to share state between multiple components or persist data across uh, session or browser windows. So yeah, you can simply declare a state and uh, use your state hook. Um, okay, there was an example where we have a simple uh, test task, but what if we have a bigger application? Uh, what if we have a lot of small components that are responsible for specific logic? Uh, what should we uh, keep the state, the one state in the, com uh, in the parent? Let's assume we, we did like this, uh, but the problem, um, the issue arises when a deeply nested child requires a data from a component higher and higher up in the tree. So it leads uh, to a props drilling. It's a terrible practice in React world. And what can we do with the props drilling? <laughs> we can uh, use a state management solution, either or context API React for React applications. So yeah, React context API is a feature provided in React, introduced in React version 16. Uh, Yes, you may want to use it uh, when you need to share data or state across multiple components in your React application without having to pass data through props at each level. Only thing you need to do is to wrap a uh, parent component into the corresponding um, context provider. And in the child's, you need to use hook, use context. It returns the context value of the context you passed. So here, is typical, uh, here is a typical use, use cases. Uh, a them if you have a if your support uh, if your application supports a theming, um, also language you can put in the context, and another example cart or checkout state in e-commerce apps and user authentication state if your application has a login feature. Uh, the question arises: Why not everybody just use React use, uh, React context as a main state management? Well, there are some potential problems you may face. Uh, the first one is uh, performance issues. This is because changes to the context can cause all components that rely on it to be rendered even if the changes are unrelated to those components. So this can lead to unnecessary re-renders and decreased performance. Also, is, uh, as your application grows in complexity, managing state with the context API can become more difficult to maintain. And debugging also can be more difficult when using context API since changes can be happen in different places, in multiple places and in multiple times. So if you uh, find some of the problems, it may be time to consider switching to a more advanced state management tools. And here is a timeline <coughs> of when some of state management libraries was created. So Redux and Mobix are two of the most established and widely adopted state management tools. Uh, both have amassed uh, large and active communities of developers. So get ready to dive <laughs> in Redux. It's a state management library for JavaScript application invented in 2015 uh, by Dan Abramov and Andrew Clark based on Flux architecture and functional programming. How Redux works, uh, works very quickly. The store is the central place where the entire uh, state of the application is stored. Uh, then dispatch, we have a dispatch, it sends an action to the store and it is the only way to update the state uh, of the application in Redux. Actions, it's a payloads with information that you want to send from the component uh, to the store. <coughs> and reducers, uh, it's a functions that specify how exactly state actually should, should chain, change. Uh, basically it's the same schema, but also it's include a UI layer, a component, and yeah, the store, notifies all part of the UI that are subscribed to it, the store has been updated, and each component forces a re-render. So basically the same schema, but just with UI. 
Redux offers several advantages uh, that make it a popular choice. Redux follows a strict unidirectional data flow, making it easier to understand how data changes in the application over time. Redux uh, centralizes the application state in a single store. Redux provides uh, support for time travel debugging. Also, uh, Redux has a rich middleware ecosystem and a large and active uh, community. However, working with Redux can also present some challenges. The first one, Redux requires writing uh, more code compared to the other state management solutions. Redux also has a big learning curve, uh, particularly for beginners, and Redux can be overkill for small or simple applications. Uh, also, Redux relies on immutability and shallow equality, um, equality checks to determine if the state has changed. So this can impact performance, especially when dealing with large or deeply nested state objects. So it's important to estimate the specific needs of your application and consider the trade-offs and before deciding to use Redux. Redux Toolkit was introduced uh, uh, in response to feedback uh, from the Redux community that Redux can be too verbose and difficult to set up. So in the documentation of Redux, uh, in the best practices section, you can find that Redux Toolkit now it's a recommended tool set for using Redux. And here are some of the key changes introduced in Redux Toolkit. It's reducer logic simplification. Um, we, we have a create slice function, and this function automatically generates action created and redu uh, reducer function. So you can compare the amount of code that we have to write before and, and currently. Uh, Redux Toolkit uses the Emir library. With Emir, you can write the code uh, that looks like here, so you can directly change a field of an object. And under, under the hood, Redux tool, uh, Toolkit will, be, will do the same actually as, as here, as it was before. Uh, important note, you can write that code like this um, to change uh, directly uh, object field only in the slice function, so not in the component. Redux Toolkit also has a Redux uh, Toolkit query data fetching API. It is designed to simplify a common case for loading data in a web application, eliminating the need to hand write data fetching, caching logic, and managing uh, loading and error statuses. Some of the key features are automatic data caching. Um, now I have a pre-recorded demo to demonstrate uh, automating data cache. Uh, we will see a list of APIs and um, that we get from a backend site, and then I will open exact exact item in the list, and the data will be cached. And then I can navigate forth and back, and we will um, without without additional requests, it will works. Uh -huh, not this. Here is the list. <laughs> Here is the API's um, uh, request. Then I go to the fifth number <laughs> item, here is the get request, then I uh, clear a network, go back, there is no additional request, and then I go to the fifth uh, item, also there is no additional request. So this is how automating data cache working. So yeah, the application was built with Redux Toolkit query. Uh, also, uh, Redux Toolkit query includes support for handling errors, errors that occur uh, during data request. So that is how we um, by uh, handle the errors and loading status. So all of by um, uh, developers do it uh, with the with the um, manually. <laughs> Sorry, and uh, this is how it works now. We just uh, take a zero and it's loading from the hook. And now let's dive into another state management. It's Mobix. How Mobix works? We have the observer. Here it is in the code, the observer wrapper around the timer view React component. It will automatically detect that rendering depends on the timer seconds past observable. And even though this relationship is not explicitly defined, the reactivity system will take care of re-rendering and the component will precisely, um, when precisely that field uh, update, um, it will be changed. The, the re-rendering will happen. Also, here is the schema. Every event on click or something invokes an action um, that updates an observable state. It quantifies the computed values 
and of course it triggers uh, side effects like re-render. Some features that uh, Mobix provide to us. It's simple and intuitive, uh, it requires minimum boilerplate code and it follows a more declarative and reactive programming model. Also automatic reactivity yeah, simplifies the process of keeping the UI in sync with the state. Also mutable state, uh, it can make it easier to work with and can be useful for application with uh, high performance requirements. Also it supports a multiple stores, it can be useful in scenarios when you need to separate areas of your, of your states. Of course uh, some problems <laughs> should be, tooling and ecosystem is not maybe mature or extensive of, uh, as those of Redux. Also mutable state, um, it can be a problem in the feature, yeah, uh, bugs can be harder to trace and debug and debugging uh, becomes a more time consuming task. Uh, the absence of strict guidelines and patterns can make it more challenging to maintain um, a consistent structure and organization in larger uh, code bases. Mobix offers uh, more flexibility in terms of uh, its programming model and reactivity system, but uh, this flexibility can also lead to inconsistency and um, varying patterns across different um, parts of code base. In 2019, there was created another state management solution. Uh, it's a Zustand. Yeah, I, I tried to find uh, the correct pronunciation in German in Zustand, in English it's Zustand. Let, let me please continue with Zustand. Don't ask English to pronounce. So yeah, uh, it's a lightweight state management library. Zustand is based on three main concepts: it's state, action, and selectors. State. Uh, is an object that represents the current state. Here's the beers. <laughs> Actions are functions that modify um, the state. Here it is increase uh, population and remove all beers. And selectors, it's a function that derive a new value based on the current state. Here is a from the use store. Um, the pros of the Zustand, um, it's simplicity. Zustand has a little boilerplate and you don't have to write as much code as you need um, as for example with Redux, and also it doesn't need a provider, as in Redux. Zustand is designed to be fast and efficient, and it uh, uses uh, a centralized store and a lightweight API to minimize unnecessary renders. So conceptually, conceptually Zustand and Redux are quite similar. Both are based on an immutable state management model. <laughs> and the problems. While Zustan provides a flexible API, handling a complex state interaction can be um, more uh, additional customization required and uh, more code organization, so can be more difficult. And Zustan is a relatively a new library, so its ecosystem is still growing. And the, um, this may mean that there is a few resources and community supports available compared to the established libraries already. Justin can be a great choice uh, for smaller to medium sized application or situation where simplicity and lightweightness are prioritized. And yet yeah, to sum up um, uh, all of the uh, libraries, Redux is a power state, um, <coughs> powerful state management library that is well suited for large and complex application. Mobix is more flexible than Redux and easier to get started with and it's ideal for applications that require uh, a more reactive programming style. Zustand is a lightweight uh, alternative to Redux and Mobix and is well suited for small to medium sized applications. And let's compare their size. <coughs> uh, yeah, as I said before, Zustand is a lightweight uh, library, so it has a minimum bundle size and the uh, download time is the the fastest. <coughs> so uh, let's compare the popularity by downloads. Uh, Redux have uh, more than 10 million downloads. For Mobix and it's mo a little more than 1 million and for Zustand it's 1 million and a half, a little more than. And also I compare them by the jobs. I um, search for the job on LinkedIn in Europe. Um, 
just uh, to, def to, de to define what, which technologies are in demand on the labor market. So yeah, Redux um, have uh, almost 5,000 uh, results in, in the search. So it's more demanding than other libraries. Uh, clearly, there are other libraries for state management less popular. For example, a factor. Um, here is the syntax, uh, the syntax of uh, a factor, and I don't know how to use that dollar sign. To me, it reminds uh, jQuery. And um, there are, uh, of course, a new state management libraries like Jotai, like Recoil. I put uh, here a links so you can uh, later just to meet and explore them. Um, there are so many technologies and solutions, so how to understand which one to use? Um, if I were writing uh, brief instructions on when and what type of storage uh, to use, I would start by putting uh, a state in your components. It could be enough just to use only it. Uh, whenever a piece of state needs to be shared uh, between components, leave the state up to the parent. And if a prop drilling becomes an issue, throw it into, into context. And if there are performance issues or, or context storage becomes too complicated, clearly uh, set up a state management. Also, don't forget uh, about local storage, session storage, and cookies. Uh, there are <laughs> variety of libraries, we, uh, of libraries which is basically do the same. They all store and manage data. Each of uh, approach has its own benefits and drawbacks, and the choice of each approach to use will depend on several factors. Of course, it's a uh, experience in the team and maybe preferences in the team and uh, of course the specific needs of your application and business needs and uh, our work our mission as as a developers is to find the balance between not to over engineer our applications and the opportunity to scale it in the future so yeah that's it thank you